Hey, everybody, this is TJR. I'm really excited because tonight, Robert and I are going to discuss the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album in depth. Wait, no, this is TJ. What? TJ, I thought we were going to discuss the classic 1978 movie with the Bee Gees and Peter Frampton, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. I thought that's what we were talking about tonight. Do we have to? Well, somebody's got to do it. It was 20 years ago today. Hi, this is Robert Kinsler. You know, not everyone has seen or even heard about the 1978 musical comedy Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Obviously, we're not talking about the Beatles here. We're talking about the movie. And it's amazing. It featured Peter Frampton and the Bee Gees. And both of them were coming off some pretty career highs there when you talk about Frampton Comes Alive or Saturday Night um, Fever. Absolutely. It featured more than 20 Beatles classics. And not only were the Beatles songs in there, but they were produced by George Martin. And that's a name I don't think we need to say much more than that. And it had also included the engineering um, work of Jeff Emmerich, who also worked on many of the Beatles' great, great songs. And yet, despite all that, and some of the key guest stars, both when you talk about actors and musicians, you know, the movie in many ways, many people just haven't heard about it or maybe they haven't seen it. Well, I think that part of the reason, though, is that everybody involved kind of wishes that everybody would forget that it ever happened. Um, I mean... I heard once read that the Bee Gees described this film as the, one of the best of times, but one of the worst of films. And George Harrison actually expressed sympathy for both Peter Frampton and the Bee Gees because he said that they worked really hard to gain success in the music industry and that this film kind of put a, a real nail into it for them, so to speak. But let's talk a bit about the history here. <laughs> the film came out in 78, and I remember being a kid when it was in theaters. I remember I was just getting into popular music at the time, and I was already becoming a Beatles fan. And then I heard about this movie, and I was just so excited. I was, I was in high school, but at the tail end of my oh, high okay. school years. All right. I think I was probably, I'm thinking just coming off of junior high or getting into my first year of high school. And at this point in time, you were talking about Frampton and the Bee Gees uh, being on career highs. It was two years prior in 76, Frampton had released Frampton Comes Alive, which was this monster, monster album for him. Um, the Bee Gees Saturday Night Fever soundtrack had hit in 1977, and that was a monster release for them. Uh, we should mention, while this film did well, uh, it made money. It wasn't a total failure. It didn't do what they wanted it to do by any stretch definitely of the imagination. what I would describe as a as being a modest hit at best. You're right, modest hit. They spent about 13 million, they made 20 million, it made some money, but it was not the huge film they were hoping for. And I think some of it had to do with the fact that the Disco Sucks movement was coming into full was starting to happen at that point. And rock fans were not happy with what Frampton had released after Comes Alive. Mm -hmm. And I think some of that played into it. Um, but I saw the film as a kid. I was very excited to see it. Now, let me just ask you this. At the time you saw it, what was your reaction then? I saw it back in the theaters when it came out, and I hadn't seen it again until I viewed it last night. So I must have not been very impressed because when it came out on DVD and a few years back, I didn't rent it. I didn't try to pursue and get it. I did um, recently pick up the Blu-ray, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um you know, when you say fantastic, do you mean the movie or do you mean? The well, music? I mean, the, the releases because it sounds and looks spectacular. Again, it's, so it's been restored. And I kept when I'm watching it, I go, I remembered very little of the original viewing. I remembered Earth, Wind and Fire. And then I remember the scene with Aerosmith, which is a key scene in the film. And then I remembered, I think, a little bit of the band playing toward the beginning with George Burns. But I, most of it I had frankly forgotten about. So it must have not made a really big impression on me. I remember at the time liking it, but as years went by, as I looked back on it, I remember thinking it was really dumb uh -huh. as I got older, as I would remember my memory of it was that that was kind of a dumb movie. Right. And um, so we both just watched it last night, just in general. What are your thoughts? In general, there's parts that were, 
were campy. There were parts that were charming. I was genuinely moved at the at the end, and and there's going to be spoilers here. We both acknowledge that. Yeah. Where yeah. where Peter Frampton's love interest, where she she you know is killed, and um and you know I thought that the, those were kind of you know some of the what what would you say some of the traditions as far as funerals and those kind of things. I found those somewhat moving in the context because by and large this is kind of comedic. This movie, I think yeah. we could agree on that. Yeah. But there's some parts of this movie whether we're talking about the movie and the soundtrack or we're talking about the movie itself that are clunky, that are, that are, you know, kind of like, Oh my God, what were they thinking moments? Um, there's parts where you see like maybe they're trying to take some creative elements that were introduced in a movie like help or maybe in star Wars or maybe in, you know, HR puff and stuff or something. And uh -huh. there's all these things that are mixed in. And, um, but I didn't want to shut the movie off though. I didn't find it so terrible that uh -huh. I had to stop watching. And there yeah. were some of the musical moments that I, I did, had not remembered like Robin Gibbs singing, Oh, darling. I'm like, wow, that's actually really good. You know, and I forgot about it, but um, oh, darling apparently charted back in upon its release. And that is, you know, a great showcase for Robin Gibbs, very soulful vocals. Oh, oh, darling. Please believe me. So I, I, I guess I'm still processing, you know, what I saw last night. What, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I will quote a critic who said, this is not a good film, but its heart is in the right place. And I kind of feel that way. Um, the film, there's a couple things we should talk about. I guess there's the music part of it. Right. I would say there's some some pretty good to passable covers of Beatles songs mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. There's a few exceptional standouts. And of course, the two exceptional standouts is Earth, Wind and Fire's Got to Get You Into My Life. Right. And Aerosmith's uh, Come Together, which you mentioned right. as well. And those have both stood the test of time. Yeah. Big time. You still hear them on the radio. People still remember those covers, even if they don't remember the movie. And I think the reason why those two stand out is because in each case, you've got the individual artists putting their own personal stamp on that cover. In doing research for this video, I read that when George Martin heard Earth, Wind & Fire's version, he said, we should have done the whole soundtrack this way. And I think what he meant by that was having each individual artist put their own personal, personal stamp on it. I read in interviews that George Martin believed that this film would be a disaster, mm -hmm. but he decided to work on the soundtrack to be the producer for the soundtrack because he felt if someone else did it, it would be a whole lot worse. But remember all these songs, you're, you're putting them up against the greatest band of all time. And they're, you know, they're versions that are so, you know, they're imprinted on our brains. So in such a big way, it's hard to hear past that. It's hard to ruin Beatles songs, in my opinion. It's hard to cover them and F them up. I have seen some music artists do it. And maybe that's a topic of discussion someday. Right, right. If we're feeling pretty ornery, one day we might do that. But as I watch the film, here are some of my criticisms of it. You basically got two plots going on. You've got the plot where the Sgt. Pepper Band, which is the Bee Gees and Peter Frampton, get signed to the big evil record label. Uh -huh. And they get they get suckered into signing the contract in a Balkanal orgy party that they're not prepared for because they're just small town boys. And they get suckered into doing this. That There's that plot. Then there's the plot where mean Mr. Mustard, this character who comes out of nowhere, is comes to the town after the after the band leaves the band of the town of Heartland. Right. Which is, you know, where they're from. And he's instructed by this mysterious villain called uh, FVB uh -huh. to steal the original Sgt. Pepper instruments. And we should mention there is some backstory in case you haven't seen the movie. There is some backstory where we find out the Sgt. Pepper band initially, we show them in World War I at the beginning of the film. We show them through the decades as this band uh, whose music actually helped end World War I. That's uh -huh. how whimsical this film is and the yeah. film is very whimsical and it's very campy um very campy. you can't get too overly critical when you're watching it there's this original band and then of course the original sergeant pepper passes on and of course the the mantle is passed down 
to young Billy Shears, played by Peter Frampton, and his friends, uh, the three Henderson brothers, played right. by the Bee Gees. And so when they leave town, they get secretary to sign this recording contract. Then there's the second plot where after they leave town, Mean Mr. Mustard is instructed to steal the original Sgt. Pepper instruments. We're never told why or what they do. Right. What is the reason for it? He's supposed to take them to three different people. There's, there's um, Dr. Maxwell Edison, which is how they, how they shoehorn in the song, Maxwell Serrano. Right. <laughs> there's Mr. Sun, which I was expecting to hear Sun King, uh-huh. but it's played by Alice. He, this character is played by Alice Cooper, but instead he does the song because. Uh-huh. And then the other one, he's told he can keep the drum. Why? We don't know. Yeah, we don't know that. Why, Mr. Yeah. Is supposed to keep the drum. And then the other instrument is supposed to go to FVB, the, the, the mysterious villain, which ends up standing for future villain band, uh-huh. which ends up being Aerosmith. Uh-huh. Doing come together. Now, what was the purpose of stealing the instruments? What magical properties? I assume they had magical properties. That's why they were being stolen. What were they supposed to do exactly? But after the instruments are stolen, the town of Heartland falls into darkness and becomes a haven for casinos, prostitution, um, teenagers carousing, dogs and cats living together. (laughs) <laughs> um ghostbusters it just overnight becomes this this dark seedy place and so um frampton's girlfriend and sometimes i'm going to refer to these people by their real names i know versus their character names and Billy Shears strawberry, girlfriend, field, right? strawberry fields played by She's sandy like, farina sandy farina who um was a singer songwriter herself right and exactly. later had a career as a uh as a backup singer in tv commercials that was probably her, uh, her went, uh, that was probably the majority of her career. Yeah. Um, who was, who was very, got a very good voice. Yeah. She comes back to warn them of what's happening to Heartland so that they can come back and save the town. Right. Now, the weird thing is, is the plot with the record label never gets resolved. No, they've it does signed not. this record deal, nothing ever comes of it. Um, they have to track down the instruments and get them back. And of course, um, Peter Frampton and Steven Tyler of Aerosmith, they have this little cat fight with each other. The claws actually come out <laughs> and, you know, they, they fight, uh, they fight. Um, Frampton is losing to Steven Tyler, but, but Strawberry Fields, who is tied up, chained up during this scene, manages to subdue uh, Steven Tyler. He's she kills him actually. Yeah, she does. And then of course she gets killed. It's kind of like we're never told what these instruments, what they're supposed to do. And after they get all the instruments back, mean Mr. Mustard gets his van back. And then he's told just to bring them all to FVB anyways. Uh-huh. So why didn't they do that in the first place? Why were they given to, to Dr. Maxwell Edison and Mr. Sun? And yeah, we, just, we never find that out. It's never really made clear. Yeah. Of course, the real reason is because we're trying to shoehorn in the songs. And the plot is all over the place because the needs of the songs outweigh the needs of the plot. But I think the worst part of it is that at the end, Strawberry Fields is, is killed. There's a funeral sequence like you're talking about. Right. And we use the song golden slumbers for the funeral sequence and it is pretty well done actually. Yeah. And I thought that was pretty emotive. I mean, yeah, I thought it, it that, is, that was it one is of emotive. the it has, powerful moments in the yeah. film. Like I said, toward the end there, I'm not sure the film earns it, but yeah. it still manages to be emotive. I think because the, the music is so good and the performance yeah. of uh, the performance of golden slumbers and carry that weight is really well done. Yeah. I think so too. So I think, I think we kind of, it kind of helps substitute for the fact that the film doesn't quite earn this moment. Mm-hmm. And so um, then we go into, of course, the classic A Day in the Life. And I noticed there was there was a shot at a newspaper headline from the Heartland newspaper that says, you know, Strawberry Fields sacrifices herself to save the town. Yeah. Then there's a lower headline that says man commits, uh, I forget his name, commits suicide in car. Uh-huh. And that second headline is only there 
so that when Barry Gibbs sings the first lines, he blew his mind out in a car. It makes some sense. Yeah. And then it goes into this kind of this kind of dream sequence where he remembers we're suddenly back with the recording studio. Um, Barry Gibb and the the record mogul played by Donald Pleasance are sharing a joint while the band is working on a song. Yeah. We're and it's like, here. okay, so why are we back here now? I, I don't know why. I have a clue why. And then it goes back to the present date of the funeral. Peter Frampton is about to commit suicide and jump off a roof of a yeah. two-story building, which may not be successful in killing him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then the original Sergeant Pepper comes back to life, only now he's played by Billy Preston. Right. Who does get back, yeah. which is one of the better covers. Yeah. It's and fun. Course, I, I, Billy Preston has a joyful spirit that actually, him more does. probably than the script or anything, he, it actually, that's another one of the better renditions in the movie. He does have a joyful spirit and he's eminently qualified to cover the song because he played on the original. Right, exactly. But he just comes to life, zaps lightning out of his hand, you know, puts, <laughs> puts Peter Frampton back on the roof and brings Strawberry Fields back to life. I know. It's just this, and how? It's just, this, I mean, I know this is a, a whimsical movie. I know you're not supposed to take it too seriously, but it's this, like, okay, then why didn't you do this earlier? Why, right. didn't you just, <laughs> why didn't you bring the instruments back earlier? It's just, it's just, it goes kind of beyond ridiculousness. Yeah, it does. Uh, it, and the story you have, you have to really suspend kind of links to reality. You have to spend a lot. Yeah, you do. It's just, you know, I know you could say that for any kind of fantasy or science fiction or any kind of movie like, but yeah, this is, but this movie, even in its own little world, it's, it, it definitely challenges you to, to be suspend, you know, belief for a while, you know, it definitely does that. Um, these two, and the thing is, it would have been, it would have might've worked if the two plot threads had kind of come together in some way at the end. Like maybe the record mogul was FVB and maybe he was going to get these instruments because they had magical properties, which you'd have to explain in some kind of backstory. Maybe if they'd come together in some way, but they don't. And um, also, I, I think that the plot, I think they should have abandoned the instrument plot and just stuck with the record label plot where, um, where they are corrupted by this and how do they get back to where they were. Uh -huh. That might have been a better film. I think you could still do a musical comedy fantasy. The whole FVB thing, future villain band, you have to have George Burns' narration to explain everything. Yeah, exactly. To tell exactly. you what's going on here. As a film, it's pretty flawed. Right. But it, it still is. has some fun moments. It there does. are some actually some fun kind of whimsical comedy to it uh -huh. that I found myself laughing out loud at. And there are some good uses of the music. I think to me, one of my favorites Besides Aerosmith and Earth, Wind and Fire, which kick butt over the whole film, mm -hmm. those two performances, the one that really works for me really well is the use of I Want You, She's So Heavy. Mm -hmm. When the Beatles, well, not the Beatles, when <laughs> Frampton and the Bee Gees get off the plane to Los Angeles and they meet the big record producer in the stretch limousine and he's there, I want you, I want you so bad. Right. Played by Donald Pleasance. That works really well. And then his limo driver is looking at Peter Frampton saying, I want you. I want you so bad. Also, you have Dougie Shears, uh, Billy Shears' brother, who's their manager, looking at the limo driver saying the same thing. They yeah. start setting up this whole you know, triangle of, of, of desire that never gets resolved. And that's right. another thing. During this Balkanal orgy, Frampton cheats on his girlfriend. Or I yeah. should say Billy Shears cheats on Strawberry Fields. Right. And I kept thinking when she comes, when she finally leaves Heartland and comes and to, to go visit the band and tell them what's happened, I just kept thinking like, um, you know, you cheated on her. Is there any comeuppance for this for yeah. you? I mean, a lot um, of things aren't really resolved in any kind of no. way that, that mirrors reality at all. Yeah. I mean, it's like if you're going to bring up plot threads like this, you also have to resolve them in some way. You have to bring them some kind of conclusion. And it's just kind of like, okay, it's ignored now. Um, because there was this, this whole scene where they all become corrupted through drinking, drugs. They obviously were 
interested in becoming famous and they're willing to make some compromises, but the drugs push them over the edge. They're taken advantage of. Yes, they're definitely taken advantage of. But that should have been the story. That whole conflict with them in the record label, that should have been the over, that should have been the whole story. It might have been a more interesting film. And I agree with your HR Puffin stuff analogy. There's a, at times, there's a very Sid and Marty Croft vibe. There is very much. Yeah, it's aside from the Balkan orgy bad. drug party yeah. scenes, it's a it it feels very Sid and Marty Croft at times, especially Mean Mr. Mustard. The other th- interesting thing, and I think I read this on Wikipedia, but I guess that this album, you know, so many millions of copies of the album, they had all these, the soundtrack had all these uh, expectations about its success. Many of them had to be taken back by the label, and actually, they destroyed millions of copies of this album. It is. I should mention there's actually a scene during the um, kind of, I guess you would call like the montage rise to fame. Right. It opens with a little line saying, and now the band begins a difficult one week struggle to fame. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and some of those little, uh, those titles, those intertitles were They're pretty funny. funny. Yeah, they are funny. Um, but there is, um, there's a sequence where as they're making appearances in concerts and on TV shows, and then they have their own TV special, um, there is a sequence where their albums are being made and it's actual real footage of the manufacturing of the soundtrack album for the movie. It's amazing. Yeah. It's a little mini commercial right yeah. inside the movie for the soundtrack. We've talked about some of the highlights in terms of the soundtrack, but are do we both are we both thinking about the same track that is the worst on the soundtrack? Or, or did you want to um, tell me what you think is your worst song on the soundtrack? For for me, the single worst um for the single poorest soundtrack on there is when I think the group is called star guard S T A R G A R D. Uh-huh. They perform Lucy in the sky with oh. diamonds. No, you're thinking and, of and Lucy and the diamonds Lucy. Or, oh, they, is that no. the name of the group? Yeah. The band is, the band is literally called, they're an all girl group. They're literally called Lucy and the diamond. This is TJR from the future, interrupting Robert and TJR in the past. It turns out that star guard was the name of the real, all-girl group that played the Diamonds in the film. And of course, Lucy was played by Diane Steinberg. So it turns out we were both right. Okay. And they do perform Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds with Frampton and the Bee Gees. It's the scene where Strawberry Fields gets off the bus to Los Angeles and she sees two billboards. Right. One for Sgt. Pepper, one for Lucy and the Diamonds. And the billboards come to life, which is actually visually a pretty cool sequence. It is. That, that, that and, yeah. and they start to perform Lucy in the Sky, accompanied by the Sgt. Pepper Band, played by Frampton and the Bee Gees. I actually kind of like that cover, actually. I, I don't dislike it as much as you do. Wow, yeah. To me, the worst track is the performance of, and how do I put this? It's bad on a cinematic level and it's bad on a musical level, in my opinion. The the performance of She's Leaving Home, the opening is sung by the two robots Uh in Mr. Mustard's van. And it really just like doesn't work. No, it doesn't. With the, when you, I mean, you you cannot not compare it to the beautiful orchestral version, Mm -hmm. Paul McCartney and John Lennon and George Harrison's voices with these two robots singing the song. Now, the thing is, it redeems itself when the action switches and the vocal switches to the parents singing, you know, she, we gave her most of our lives when they start singing it. But the problem with it cinematically is that the scenes of the parents singing the song are in the background and in the foreground are the two robots watching it. Yeah, yeah. If they'd shifted the emphasis to put them in the foreground, then the song would have begun to redeem itself both cinematically and musically. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's a real disappointment because it's such a waste of a great song. It could have worked so much better, even if, even though it may not make sense for the parents to sing the introduction, you know, if, if, um, if the, if say the father or the mother had sung it or anybody else had sung it, you know, some narrator had sung it. But to have the robots do it, me and Mr. Mustard's robots do it, just, uh, you know, yeah. it just I, think, I almost wonder if these are the, the, even the inclusion of the robots in this, because we're coming off kind of like the the uh, like the Star Wars thing with robots and droids yeah. and stuff. 
and and it's like and there's later on and and you tell me the scene i remember there's one scene where there's a little fight and it looks like a mini lightsaber battle you see you know later in the film and it's like they threw a little bit of everything in here but so occasionally the elements worked Mm -hmm. like we've been talking about but more often than not if we're talking about the movie side of it even separating from the music when you talk about as a film more often than not there was not an artful flow to this stuff at all yeah they're just throwing everything at at, at the ceiling and even a little of the stuff like about what the recording contract came to mind a little bit of brian de palma's uh the phantom of the paradise that i know we talked about years back but i mean they're almost like all these movies that had come out you know some of the popular or um influential movies that had come out or tv shows in those the few years leading up to this period they're there you know, yeah. and it's like you, you see all those elements kind of floating, coming in and out. I mean, it's it's it is a truly a bizarre experience to watch the movie today. You know, I had I had not thought about the uh, about the uh, Phantom of the Paradise uh, analogy, but you're, I agree. With you, I agree with you. You're right. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing that occurred to me and, you know, a lot of the criticisms that you've heard over the years on on Magical Mystery Tour. And this has some of those kind of same problems that that did were that there's some fine musical moments not as probably as many you know per minute as like in the beatles magical mystery tour because there's not a clunker on that soundtrack yeah but but you know kind of one of these things where like you said the heart was in the right place there was a lot of probably creative energy put into it um they're trying to put humor and charm and all these things and it just ultimately you know it, it was probably a misfire but am i glad i saw it definitely i'm glad i saw it now and i'm glad that it's it's available now for people that maybe didn't see it back in the day and are fans of some of these artists and these actors and and it's it's kind of nice to be able to look back at it like we're doing now discuss it and then kind of appreciate it for its for its charms and for the time in which it was you know made and presented. i i think if you're in the mood for something kind of goofy and dumb Uh there is some there is some enjoyable comedy in this film there are some good musical moments. It's a fun watch if you're not going to take it too seriously. And it, you could just look at it as one of those um, so bad that it's good mm-hmm. kind of uh, experiences. But there are some genuinely good things in it. But let's talk about that ending real quick. After everything is set right, uh-huh. you know, through the magic of Billy Preston. Right. Um, it cuts to this big sing-along chorus of the title song with a huge ensemble chorus of the cast and a lot of musicians and actors who are not in this film, but just are there to sing the ending. Mm -hmm. And it's very much kind of a cinematic play on the original album cover where you're looking at it and you're saying, you know, okay, who's this? Who's that? Who's this? Who's that? And there is literally a who's who there some of the names, a lot of the people back then, I didn't recognize. There are people that you're going to look in there and think, why are they there? And then you're uh-huh. there people like, really? They're in that? But among them, among some of the names in there, Carol, actress Carol Channing, Tina Turner, Seals and Croft. I think I saw Angelica Houston. Uh-huh. John Mayle is in there. Niels Lofgren is in there. Yeah, Niels Lofgren was a name that really surprised me. Yeah. Robert Palmer is in there. Helen Reddy. Wolfman Jack, I remember seeing. Wolfman Jack, right? Wolfman Jack is in there. Jose Feliciano. Um, According to some information that I found on this, Hart is in there. Yeah, they are. I can't find him. Got to tell you this. I found this out. Okay. Apparently, George Harrison, Paul McCartney, and Linda McCartney were there. They were, but they elected not to be in it. The scene. Wow. But they were there. No apparently. Yeah. So you just wow. had to tell you that. Go ahead. That is some true. That is some, uh, something that I did not know, but anyway, yeah, you see the invitation and most of the photos are running through the gallery pretty quickly, but they keep that on the screen for a while. And then they have all kinds of promo shots. And I guess there was even a series of, uh, trading cards. I don't remember those, huh. uh, that were issued and, and they even show, really nice you can see all the trading cards yeah the movie has this huge legacy and it's become kind of i think a cult classic maybe not as big as some cult classics but it's yeah but then the look and the feel of it like i said is very much of its time yeah it's It's not very dated looking where it transcends 
you know, Wizard of Oz, like we both said, that's I think our favorite movie, both for both of us. Yeah. Um, it's that movie is is it's like it's sent down from the heavens or something. It's so it transcends incredible. time, yeah. And this movie is very much of its time. This film does but, not. <laughs> yeah. But but if you but if you like some of these people like George Burns, it's kind of I mean, and George Burns was in his early 80s when he did it. He's singing and he's dancing and stuff. Yeah. And it, there's know, a scene with him with a Gibson guitar strapped around his shoulder. Yeah. And you know how heavy Gibson Les Pauls are. I, I can't play one. That's too heavy for my little. And friend. I'm thinking, my gosh, that guitar is probably heavier than George Burns. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's amazing that he's up there. All, you know, he's, he's like doing this. With it. Yeah. Yeah. And there, and you go and, you know, I, what I would recommend to people is if they've watched this far into our discussion, they watch the movie and then go back and read some of the, the mm -hmm. reviews because I think the reviews written at the time are probably really cruel. But I mean, they were very negative. More, whereas if you see some of the reviews of other people that are posting now, a lot of people say, hey, it can't be fun. Like I said, I think uh, if you're not going to take it too seriously, not going to be ultra critical, and you just want some campy, goofy fun, this is a movie that you, you might enjoy. So um, uh, just want to thank everybody for watching i think we've talked this out yeah we have okay and please don't hate everybody for watching. If, you, if you hate this movie yeah let us know what you think of the film if you've ever seen it before give us your thoughts and if you like this video please click like and click the bell notification icon so you can know when new videos come out and everybody just thank you so much for watching hey good to, thanks for checking in everyone great to see you all right bye-bye